Hello, and welcome back to Keys to Christ Ministries. I'm your host, Keenan Saunders, and I'm thankful that you could join us for another installment in the series, Daniel's Deepest Secrets. We continue to look into the book of Daniel and to study the truths that are contained therein, and prayerfully, God has been shedding light upon our hearts, and we have been receptive to this light, allowing these truths to not only intellectually settle us, but spiritually begin to settle us into the message that we may not be moved, that God, through the prophetic page, would give us the everlasting gospel to prepare us, our home, and those we know and love, and have the ability to reach, and that they also may be prepared for the crisis that is before us, and most importantly, for the second coming of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we begin and introduce our topic, I would like to invite us to pray and ask that the Holy Spirit would bless us with His presence and with His teaching. Let us pray. Our loving Father, You love us with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, Lord, it is how You draw us. We thank you that you have drawn us even to study your word. And as we go to study your word, Lord, we pray that our hearts may be prepared to understand and most importantly to receive this message upon good ground, Lord. Only you can produce a good ground heart. Only you can create a clean heart. And we're asking that you would do that. Please take away our stony hearts. Give us a heart of flesh. Give us receptive minds, obedient hearts, and help us, dear God, to bear fruit unto glory, that thy will may be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we are looking at the book of Daniel, we are continuing in Daniel chapter 7. We're continuing to look at the characteristics of the little horn, which we have been studying. And as we have been discovering and seeing prayerfully, that this little horn power that Daniel chapter 7 describes that comes out from the ten divisions of the pagan Roman Empire can be none other than the papal power. Today we are going to be studying the principle of prophetic time in light of a, of a time period this little horn would have both the time laws and the saints given into his hand or would seek to usurp God's authority. Our title for, today's talk, for today is 538 AD to 1798 AD, God's Prophetic Timekeeping in a Day for a Year Principle. Again, 538 AD to 1798 AD, God's Prophetic Timekeeping and a Day for a Year Principle. Let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 7, and let's notice verse number 25. Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to notice verse number 25. The Bible tells us that this little horn power, in verse 25, it says, And he, the little horn, shall speak great words against the Most High. We'll look at that more clearly and definitely in another installment and shall wear out the saints of the most high again we'll look at that as well and think to change times and laws that's what we looked at in our last installment the change of the fourth commandment the seventh day sabbath and a sunday law within the jurisdiction of the reformed regenerated but not renewed roman empire and it says this, And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Today we're going to be really focusing in on the time, times and the dividing of time, this prophetic period of time that the papal church would be ruling and also would have the times and the laws and the saints given into its hand or would proclaim itself 
as God Almighty upon earth and would try and seek to not only change the times and laws, but would also persecute the saints of God. Again, these principles will continually be unfolded to us, but we're going to look at and understand here today the difference between biblical time or literal time and prophetic time so that we may understand what Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 is speaking about with this time period that the papal church would rule the earth both politically and spiritually and religiously, okay? And we're also going to uh, have this understanding for future studies as the book of Daniel also gives us other time, uh, pr prophetic time periods that we need to understand in light of the principles of the Word of God upon time prophecy. Amen? All right. And so to understand the principles of the time period that the papal power would rule the world, we need to understand the difference again between literal time and prophetic time in the scriptures. All right? So the Bible lets us know that God is a God of time, but he is not bound or limited by it. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to notice verse number 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to notice verse number 1. The Bible says this. To everything there is a what? Season. And a time. To what? Every purpose under the heaven. There would be a time to be born. There would be a time to die. A time to plant. A time to pluck up. And so forth. And so the Bible says that every... For everything that is under the sun, everything that is under the heaven, there is a purpose, there is a season, there's a time, and there's a purpose, there's a fulfillment of that time. All right, now let's notice Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And verse number 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16. The Bible says this. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says this, For by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are where? In heaven and that are where? In earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and notice, for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things are made up. But I want us to really hone in on what verse 16 of Colossians 1 says. That all things were created by him and for him. If something is created for something, it has a purpose, but it's also ministering to that thing that it is created for. And so God uses time as a minister. Time has a purpose. Time is really cre a creation of God that he brought into existence when he created the earth. Amen? And we'll look at that as we go forward. Was there something before time, before God uh, put together time periods and days and weeks and years and so forth and months, all these things. Was there something before time? Notice Psalms chapter, Psalms division 90. Psalms division 90. Prayerfully we have our pencils, prayerfully we're writing this down, or even we are typing it into our computers, our laptops, so that we can re recover these truths and these gems that God is sharing with us, and also that we would share this with others. Notice Psalms chapter 90, Psalms 90. The Bible tells us in verse number 2 of Psalms 90, it says this, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So what was before time? God. 
It says everlasting to everlasting. That is no start and no finish. That is eternity to eternity. That is eternal life existing in God, in himself, in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, in the Godhead, all life consists. All things were made by Christ and all things were made for Christ. Now, I want us to go back to the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1. As God is creating the heavens and the earth, notice here time being put into place. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 3 and 4. It says this, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was what? Good. And God divided the light from the what? Darkness. Skip on down with me to verse 14 of Genesis 1 now. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for what? Signs and for seasons and for what? Days and for what? Years. Okay, that's time. Now, these heavenly bodies. And it says, And let them be for lights in the firmament of, he of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater, light, the greater light to rule the day, that's the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night, that's the moon, he made the stars also. So God, as he's creating here now on the fourth day, the Bible says that God made the, the, these lights, the sun, the moon, and the stars, for a purpose, for signs, for seasons, for days, for years. So now we're seeing time within this creation week, we also seen it previously because God says that the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, the evening and the morning were the third day, and then on that fourth day, the, su the sun, the moon, the stars. But on the first day of creation, God said that there is to be light. Remember, the Bible says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. So it was, the earth was completely dark. It was completely unformed. And when God said, let there be light, boom. There was light upon the earth. There, there was a sight that, that could be beheld, that could be seen, so God could begin this work of creation. So God could bring into existence life upon the earth. So what light was there before the fourth day, creation of sun, moon, and stars? What light? Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We've got a lot of scripture that we're going to go over today, but prayerfully it solidifies in our mind the principles and the teaching that um, of biblical time and prophetic time in the scriptures so that as we study the prophecy of Daniel and going forward, looking at the time periods that even the period of time that the papal church would rule and other time prophecies, we would have a biblical understanding and foundation. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and notice verse 6, the Bible says this, For God who commanded the what? Light to shine out of darkness. This is day one of creation. Hath shined in our hearts. This is how the gospel comes into light in our life. God's word shines into our hearts. To give what? Light, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the what? Face. Of Jesus Christ. So what was this light that was shining, that was dispelling the darkness, that hovered over the world, that was void and without form? It was Jesus Christ. That is the light. The Bible says in John chapter 1, He is the true light which lights the world. He is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. And if we follow Christ, we'll not walk in darkness. And if we also heed these principles of differentiating biblical time from prophetic time, we also will not walk in prophetic darkness. Amen? So now we want to look at biblical time. We want to break it down from day and week and month and then year. Amen? So let's look at day. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. And let's notice verse 5, right back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 
and verse number five. The Bible says this, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called what? Night. So there's two different aspects of a complete 24-hour day. It's day and night. And the Bible says, And the evening and the morning were the first day. Amen. So in, in this evening, morning, in is an action word or it's a verb which is describes what someone is doing or has done. Notice Mark chapter 1 and verse 32 as we look at a day. All right, how that's broken down and how we can understand the, 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 the time that makes up an entire day. Mark chapter 1, and we want to notice verse number 32. Mark 1 and verse number 32, the Bible tells us this. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. So what is the evening? It is the setting of the sun, or it is a complete time of darkness. And the Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day. And so a new day actually starts not at 12 p.m. at midnight, but it starts when the sun sets. A new day has begun. Amen. All right. So let's notice John chapter 11 for a moment. John chapter 11. And let's notice verse number 9. John 11 and verse 9. He, I love how Jesus himself gives us the definition of what a day is. Notice this. Jesus answered, Are there not, what, 12 hours in the day? Now the, the day and the night, right, were two aspects of a complete 24-hour day that says this, Are there not 12 hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Or he really sees Christ, right, in this context. But Jesus says that there are 12 hours in the day. And so if a complete day is made up of day and night, evening and morning, a 12, 12 hours would divide a day into two, all right? Two 12-hour periods of day and night. So 12 plus 12, basic math, 24. 24 hours in a day. And is that not even how we base our day off of 24 hours? This is the scriptures. This is how God established a day, even from the beginning, because he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. All the things that we do and go by is based on God's word, amen? but sometimes we don't give him the glory. Prayerfully, we will today. Now let's look at a week. Now let's look at a week. Genesis chapter 2, and notice verse 1 with me. A week. Genesis 2 and verse 1, the Bible says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, so God's finishing up creation week, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And I, I love how we have a connection here with even last, uh, last week's study, where we looked at the, how the papal church changed the Sabbath. But the Bible is telling us that the seventh day finishes the week. It says the heavens and the earth were finished and they were finished even when the seventh day of the week uh, finished all right six days god worked he labored he created the heaven the earth the birds the sea the trees uh, adam and eve all these things and all things that um, even from the beginning we still see today you know, we hear the birds chirping. We see the trees. We, we smell the flowers in the air. All these things that God created in that six-day period. But on the seventh day, 
He set it apart. He sanctified it. He rested. And the Bible tells us that Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So Sabbath is a minister to man, right? When man is resting, he's resting in the works of the Creator. He's resting in the righteousness of Christ. He's resting in the Word of God. And he's resting in knowing that God doeth all things well. Trust, abiding. But that is not our topic for today. What we want to understand here is that a week is made up of seven days. Amen? Before we even look at a month, because the month is a little bit more intricate to get to, let's look at a year. It's a little bit more simple description here in the Scriptures. Notice 1 Kings chapter 4. And then we'll come back and look at a month. It's because it's a little bit more intricate, so we want to understand that. 1 Kings chapter 4, and notice with me verse number 7. 1 Kings 4 and verse 7, the Bible says this, And Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the kings and his household. Each man his month in a year made provision. So each man, twelve officers, during a one month, one man for one month provided food for the king and his household, but there were 12 officers. So there is 12 months in a year. Amen? 12 months in a year. Do we still understand that? We still experience that today. Our calendars are based on a 12-month time period that make up a year. Amen? That's simple. Now let's kind of look at something a little bit more intricate, not too intricate prayerfully, but just enough to get our minds working and the the brain warmed up just as you know when you are working out you're preparing to lift some weights you're preparing to do a bench press whatever it is and you got to warm your muscles up we're warming our muscles up here as we look at a month a biblical month it's established here in the book of genesis as well chapter 7 and verse 11 as the flood begins it describes the beginning of the flood even the the month even the day Genesis chapter 7, we're going to look at verse number 11. The Bible says this, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Skip down to verse 24 of the same chapter. It says this, And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. All right, so we go from the second month, the 17th day of that month, and we're going to skip 150 days that the Bible says that the waters prevailed upon the earth, or these waters were just uh, washing over the earth as that the flood waters um, were, were still having their effects upon the earth. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 8 now, and verse number Three, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 3. The Bible says this, And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Again, the, the beginning of the flood, the 600th year of Noah, the second month of that year, the 17th day of that month, 150 days forward. And here we go. This is when those waters started to... Um, subside a little bit. Notice verse 4, it says this, And the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. So notice, if we go from the second month, the seventeenth day, 150 days forward, it brings us to the seventh month and the seventeenth day. How long is that? That is five months. And five months, if we divide 150 divided by five, it gives us the number what? 30. So a biblical month is based on 30 days. So we, need, we have to understand the natural first before the spiritual. Our nat the, the God, Jesus all often used and truly almost always used the natural things to explain spiritual things. Whether, you know, even in the book of Daniel, where 
There's descriptions of beasts, right? God is using these literal beasts that are described in, in a way that we've never seen a, a, a literal animal described because it's putting symbolic language now to that animal, adding characteristics. You know, you see a leopard with four heads and four wings. You see a lion with wings. You've never seen that. We'll never see that, right? Well, at least upon the earth, right? We don't know how, how it will be in heaven, but at least upon the earth, there's no animal that looks that way. But there's, this, there's a literal animal, there's the literal base of an animal with these extra um, points added to it and in symbolic language to describe a, a truth using the natural things, all right? So let's notice this principle, how God uses the natural so that we can understand the spiritual things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And notice with me verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and notice verse 12. The Bible says this. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing what? Spiritual things with spiritual. But verse 14, but it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so even though God can use a natural thing to explain a spiritual thing, most of the time, men do not understand. A lot of people did not understand the parables of Christ. Even Jesus' disciples did not. And they had to come afterwards to receive further instruction. And Jesus had to share with them. The, the, he had to break down the parables and explain what each part of that parable was meaning. The literal interpretation. But it was a spiritual truth being given. And so the Bible says that the natural man receives not those things. We must be born again. We must be born of above. And then we will begin to understand the truths of Scripture. And, and we've we seen that as we looked at one of our first installments in Daniel's Deepest Secrets. Just understanding prophecy. There's, there's, a, there's a purpose of the book of Daniel. And we need to seek to understand it. But we need to know that if we are not being converted, if we have not had a change of heart, a change of mind, a renewing of our minds by Jesus Christ, a change of our thoughts and desires, and we have not surrendered all to Christ, we're not really going to understand the book of Daniel. We might have an intellectual understanding, we might explain things, but we won't understand the spiritual aspects of this book and the deep truths that are there on the surface, but for the most part, we got to dig deep. we got to dig deep, all right? John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Jesus often tried to explain spiritual truths, but they were not readily received. And at one point, he lost many disciples because of trying to use, uh, trying to explain spiritual truth, even using the natural things. The Bible says this in John chapter 6 and verse 63, it says this, It is the Spirit that quickens, that, that gives life, that regenerates. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. So they're spiritual words and they are life. Now we can't just say we're spiritual people or I'm a spiritual person because I know this and that or I can do this and that. No, no, no. To be spiritual is to understand, to perceive, and to receive, and to apply, and then to share the words of the Bible. The words and the principles of the scriptures and even the prophecies. Now let's look at prophetic time. Prophetic time. Let's look at a day now. Let's look at a day. Go with me to the book of Ezekiel chapter 4, and in these two verses is often the, the platform, the, the, the springboard that is used to explain the principle of what we're going to look at in, the, in prophetic understanding of what a day 
or certain time periods represent. All right. Again. Ezekiel chapter four, let's notice verse one for a second, just for context. Thou also son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. All right. And lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about more also, nor, moreover take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city and set thy face against it and it shall be to besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it this shall be a sign to the house of israel Lie thou also on thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. So days, d days that Ezekiel was to lay upon his left side. It says this, For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, even though Daniel was lay or, or pardon me, Ezekiel was laying on his left side, for a number of days, but God is saying he's going to lay the years of their iniquity, all right? According to the number of the days. So the, the days that he was laying upon his left side were equated to the years that the iniquity of the house of Israel were to bear their iniquity. It says this, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah now. Forty days I have appointed thee each day for a year. So in this, there's, there's really this time prophecy that Ezekiel has given, but he is literally laying on his left side for 390 days. Really 390 years. The, the, the iniquity of Israel. And then on his right side, he's laying for 40 days. And it's an equating to 40 years that the iniquity of Israel was to be laid upon them. All right. And so God said, I have appointed thee each day for a year. So in prophetic language, a day represents a year. Let's notice Numbers chapter 14 now. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, right? They were rebellious. They murmured, they complained, they wanted to go back to Egypt, they built a golden calf, they worshipped it, they did all kinds of lewd acts, they wanted to kill Moses, they rebelled against God's word, they, they wanted different um, leaders over them, and so on and so forth, all this time that they were in the wilderness, and we know that they were in the wilderness for 40 days, or for 40 years. All right. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. But notice here, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, the Bible tells us this. That the, there were spies sent into the, the land of Canaan to search out that land and to see if it was a good land. Right. And so the spies were in that land, searching it out for 40 days. The Bible says this. After the number of the days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each Day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So God had to change his plans because of the failure of the children of Israel to surrender their hearts to him. God wanted the children of Israel in that promised land within a few weeks, but it took them forty years. And in that forty year time period, all the older generation had died off to where only the 20 years old and younger went into the promised land with Joshua and Caleb, these older men, because they had faith in Christ's ability to save them amply, fully, entirely. Amen. And so when we're looking at prophetic time now, there is this day for a year principle. All right. So now let's notice a week. Notice Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, and we're going to notice verse 27. Often when a man took a woman or wanted to, to wed a woman, to marry a woman, he would have to give a dowry. He would have to give a lump sum of money 
to, to the father, even to the family, to show that he was, he was worthy of being a husband, worthy and, and could provide for his wife and for his family. And that he was trustworthy, that he was a man of integrity and honesty with his money and he knew how to handle funds. Amen. But Jacob uh, was fleeing from his brother Esau who was seeking to kill him because Jacob had deceived his father Isaac and Esau into um, receiving the birthright that was to be given to the firstborn, which was really Esau. And though this birthright was actually given over to um, Jacob because Esau forsook his birthright just for a pot of lentils, but Jacob still and his mother did not have trust that Isaac would give Jacob this blessing. So they chose to rebel against the word of God and chose to put matters into their own hands and to take that birthright blessing any way they could, even through deception. And so in the process of time, Jacob has to flee his home. He has to flee to his uncle Laban, his mother tells him. And as he's approaching Laban's home, he meets a woman at a well. You know, a Jacob meets a woman at a well and he falls in love with her at first sight. You know, of course, that's never really true. But anyways, he falls in love with this woman. He wants to marry her. And so he comes and as he approaches and, and finds out, okay, this, this is the daughter of Laban, all right? And he goes to Laban now. He asks Laban if he can marry his daughter, Rachel, who he loves. And Laban says, okay, you don't, you don't have the dowry that m most men would have to present. So instead, the substitute for a man not providing the dowry would be a certain period of time that the, the man who wants to wed the daughter would work for the father and would would earn his his pay and then he would use that pay to provide that dowry or he would earn the trust of that family in a way right and so anyways long story short i've made the long story short the 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 short story kind of long but nevertheless god wants to give context to his word and so what we want to understand is that as we look at Genesis chapter 29 and verse 27, we're going to see that there is a time period that, that Jacob had actually worked for Rachel. It was to be seven years. But notice how it's described here in Genesis 29 and verse 27. The Bible says this, Fulfill her week. Now, a biblical week is made up of what? We looked at it. Seven days, and we will give thee this also for the, the service which thou shalt serve with me. Yet seven other years, all right? So seven additional years. We can go back and look at this, this account with Jacob, Laban, Rachel, and Leah, and so forth. But what we want to understand is the Bible says fulfill her week. But that week was really seven years, all right? So this week was a time prophecy it was a it was a time period that was used to describe a longer time this literal time was used to describe time in a longer sense symbolically amen so a month we looked at in in the scriptures literal would be 30 days but in prophetic language that would be 30 years now let's go back to the book of daniel and let's notice Daniel chapter 7, and let's notice verse 24 and 25 again. There's, the Bible says this, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they, the times, the laws, the saints, shall be given into his hand. Until what? A time. And a time and times and the what dividing of time. The the word time here is a Chaldean word, which actually comes from comes from the word which actually means a year. It actually means a year. The the time here. This says a time. The Chaldean word actually is interpreted a year. All right. So a year would be made up of 12 months. So 12 times 30 days in that month, 
um, for each month would give us 360 days. Now, at times is just another year added to one. So one plus one, two, right? Two years. So that's 720 days. And the dividing of time, which would be half of a time, time divided in half, which would be a half a year, which would be six months or 180 days. And this literal time of three and a half years, time plus times three years plus the dividing of time three and a half years but if we're looking at it prophetically in a adding the 360 days the 720 days and the 180 days you combine that and it gives you 1260 days but we're looking at time prophecy, so you must understand a day equals a year. And so if a day equals a year, we're looking at 1260 years that the papal power would hold dominion over the times and law, the, the law of God in a sense, though not literally, but boastfully, and even by suppressing religious liberty through a Sunday law, which was fully enacted in 538 AD and kicked off papal supremacy. So 538, adding 1260 years of torture that the saints would endure, which we'll look at in a future study, this would bring us to the year, what? 1798, which we'll look at in a future study more definite and we'll understand what really happened during that year and what really ended the reign of terror of the papacy. But we want to notice again the times, time, and the dividing of times. We want to give another witness to that prayerfully. So we remember in Daniel chapter 4 when Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind because he was lifted up with pride and he was to go into the forest, he was to go into the fields and to have the mind of a beast, you know, his, his claws would grow, his hair would grow, and, you know, he would act and live as a beast, right? The Bible says that he was to go into that, uh, into the, basically, a wilderness for, se until seven times, the Bible says, pass over him. That's Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 23. Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 23. The Bible says that. And so, if we're looking at seven times, we're looking at seven years, which literally happened. This was literally uh, an occurrence in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. In his last few years of his life, he was as a beast before God, right? And so it's seven times, seven years. So when we're looking at that time, times, dividing of times, we're looking at three and a half years. And we also see that here in Revelation chapter 12. We also see the reign of the papacy, this 1260 year time period. We see it in Daniel, but we'll further see those, those points and those principles brought out as we look into uh, further into the book of Daniel. But we see it also in Revelation when it's describing the same power that would rule for 1260 literal rule years, but prophetic time, three and a half years. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. The Bible says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. All right, this is talking about this woman, the church. It's talking about this man-child that came from the church, Jesus Christ. So this time period when Jesus Christ came to the earth the first time in human form, in, in, uh, as a babe and then into manhood and adulthood, the dragon, this power that was ruling during the time of Christ, even the, 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 the entity that crucified Christ and that, that was seeking to even kill him even at birth, even at, shortly after his birth, the Roman Empire, speaking about this dragon, it says persecuted the church. Didn't the Roman Empire persecute 
the church? Yes, they did. We know that from the annals of history. Verse 14 of Revelation 12, it says this, And to the woman were given two wings of an eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a what? Time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And so the Roman Empire, we see uh, crumbled and it grew and, and out from that empire grew the ten divisions of Rome. And from the ten divisions of Rome rose up this little horn power, this, this, this man of sin who comes from the, the, the place of Italy where his seat is established. And the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, now took on this form of a dragon power who was persecuting the woman, who was persecuting the church, who had to flee into the wilderness or who had to go into secluded places and recesses of the earth to be protected from the, the, the dogmas, from the false teachings, and from the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church. The Bible says it would be for a time, times and half a time, the same that we see in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, this 1260 year period. We also see it here in verse 6 of Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says this, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that she should feed her, that they should feed her there, a thousand two hundred and three score days a score in the scriptures is representing 20 so three score three times 20 would give us what 60 a thousand two hundred and sixty days even in revelation chapter 13 and verse number five speaking about the papal power who received a deadly wound which we'll look at in future studies and then this revived papal power that will soon come upon the earth to enact the final Sunday law, speaking about this Roman power, this papal power, even the man of sin, the Pope himself, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5, the Bible says this, and there was given him a mouth speaking great things. That's Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. And blasphemies and power was given unto him. Or what? The time and the law and the saints were given into his hand what to continue 40 and two months if you add 12 months to 24 months right 12 months one year 24 months two years and then six months half a year if you add 12 plus 24 plus 6 do you know how much it gives you in the period of months it gives you 42 months so 42 months 1,203 score days and time, times, and the dividing of times, 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 and half a time, the same time period that the papal church ruled in using symbolic language to describe the totality of the reign of the papal power or 1,260 years. This is critical to understanding the book of Revelation and even the book of Daniel, especially, especially is what we're looking at here. Daniel and Revelation, they're companion books. But as we break down these principles, even starting in the book of Daniel, it will begin to unravel to us the prophecies that are also talked about in the book of Revelation. But our foundation is the book of Daniel. Our foundation prayerfully is the word of God. And prayerfully, as we have studied here today and truly gain an understanding of the difference between literal time and prophetic time. And that prophetic time is used in the scriptures, in the prophecies, so that as we are studying the word of God, we might see the literal, but also through a converted heart, understand spiritual things. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit discerns them. The Holy Spirit teaches us. And as we become new men and new women in Christ, we begin to understand these things. And this time period doesn't just seem to be three and a half years that the papal power would rule. And even if it did, it would still be despotic and, and crazy. But knowing that for over a thousand years, this power tortured the saints. This power persecuted God's people. This power 
also warred against other nations, seeking to gain total control of the world, of the finances of this world, of the influence of this world, of the consciences of men, and even to make slaves of men, seeking the greatest seat. But now we have a seat in this prophetic view, understanding deeper prayerfully the difference between biblical time and prophetic time and prayerfully being prepared to, to understand the book of Daniel in a greater and grander way. Let us close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the clarity that your word provides. Please, dear God, make the points so clear and distinct even in our minds, even as we rest this topic for today. Please, dear God, help us to go over our notes, to restudy and to share with someone else, dear God, what we are learning, because truth is only truth to those who practice it. May we practice it, live it, and share it. By your grace, convert our hearts is our prayer. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, friends. It's been a blessing studying the Word of God as usual. And prayerfully, you will join us for our next installment in Daniel's Deepest Secrets. I appreciate your prayers and the support that you have given to Keys to Christ Ministries. Continue to pray for us. Continue to support as God leads you. And we will see you in our next installment. Until then, it's Keenan from Keys to Christ closing out. God bless and Maranatha.